Haverford School, Mr. Tyler Casertano. Tyler, thank you very much for joining me. It's it's a pleasure to meet you, even though virtually, and uh, and talk a little bit today. Now, yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for our conversation. So, Tyler, maybe you could just tell me a little bit about what it's been like uh, taking on this new role at Haverford School as the head of school. Um, I think you're in your second year now, right? Yep. Coming in just after COVID and uh, and moving from St. Albans, where you had a, a, a great you know 12 years right there, and now you're at a school that I grew up very close to, played Haverford for four years in lacrosse and never got a win against Haverford School, <laughs> even though we had some good high school teams. Um, Coach Nostrand on the other sideline, who I actually had the pleasure of coaching with here at Gilman for a couple yeah. years. Um, so what's it been like for you? It's been great. Um, year two has felt very different than year one. Uh, year one uh, was a bit of a blur, and and I tried as much as possible just to to be present and listen and learn, um, and and really not have opinions about much until I had gone through the the full cycle of a school year. And year two, things are much more familiar, um, and I, I have a better idea of how all the different things sort of connect. Uh, and, and, and intersect, um, but it's great. Um, our son is in first grade here and absolutely loves it. And uh, we actually have a child care center for faculty kids. So our daughter is down there in, in pre-K and it's, it's fun to have both of them on campus. Um, and Haverford is a, is a really special place and certainly no, no shortage of challenges coming out of COVID for us to, to tackle, but it also in some ways um, feels like a great opportunity um, to sort of hit the reset button, uh, both with, um, a new uh, a leadership change and just the sort of reemergence of of the community post COVID, it, it's uh, allowed us to step back and, and talk about who we are and what we do and how we can be our best self. And um, every day feels like we're we're fighting the good fight and pushing things forward. So you have grown up really with education in your blood, and I'd love to talk about your parents and I guess growing up on two boarding school campuses. Yep. Um, it's interesting. I was just talking to my English class about death of a salesman and what success means and different versions of success. And I was talking about how a lot of my teammates and classmates from lacrosse, playing lacrosse at Harvard, went on to go on to Wall Street after college. And I did that. I tried that for a little bit and, and I you know did a day of an internship or, or a visiting day. And I knew right away that wasn't my bag. And I know you have a very similar story that led you back into the world of education. So I'd love to hear you just talk about education, its role for you and how you, I guess, found your way back into, I guess, where you're supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you sort of summarized it uh, really well. Uh, I grew up on, on two school campuses and was so fortunate to... Uh, um, to really know nothing else other than boarding school and growing up in a boarding school, you're just surrounded by um, facilities and other faculty kids and, and teachers. And it was just an incredible environment to, to grow up and I have two brothers, an older brother and a younger brother. Um, and it just felt like we were, we were just constantly surrounded by stimulation and education. And after college, well, I knew I would love teaching and coaching I questioned whether that was genuine or whether that was just out of familiarity and, and tried Wall Street and similar to you, just knew uh, very quickly it wasn't for me um, and was fortunate to get a job at St. Albans uh, soon after that. Um, and there definitely were times where it was challenging to have all of my friends be working in sort of a handful of industries and in a handful of cities. And it sort of feels though I was on the outside looking in, um, but I was really fortunate uh, at St. Albans to have a great group of mentors um, and to have parents who who encouraged me to to follow my heart and do what, what I believed in and, and not necessarily pay too much attention to um, sort of what uh, society might have been signaling was, was sort, of, sort of the right path to go down, um, and it's it's been an amazing journey, and this is just another another step in that journey. Um, but uh, it 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 has been challenging at moments to um, not have any peers from my uh, 
certainly from, from my college experience who've gone down this path. Yeah. I was telling my class, I was like, I, I was trying to make it relevant to them uh, after reading this play, Death of a Salesman, that it's very hard to go in a different direction, especially after college where a lot of your friends and peers are joining these different industries, whether it's banking or consulting. And I told them, I was like, look, I'm one of, you know, maybe two guys on my team that started their career as a teacher. Yep. Um, but it, it's, I guess my version of what success looks like, you know, I, sure. I, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy coaching, doing a podcast. Um, it, it makes me happy. makes me fulfilled in my life. And, uh, I think it's a good lesson or, or good real life lesson to look around and see people doing different things in their lives that are, you know, you know, not what commonly are, are deemed successful, maybe not the most money in the world, but there are other ways of measuring that. Yeah, sort of eschewing a, a convention can be tough, but it's been for me, and it sounds like for you, just remarkably rewarding uh, and, and validating. I feel very lucky in this role to have a number of peers like Henry Smythe. Um, uh, there, there's a great head network in this area. Um, all of our peer schools, and we get together once a month, and there's the International Boys School Coalition, which gets... Uh, sort of together in groups periodically over the course of the year. Um, and I find so much strength and wisdom and inspiration and in, in those school heads. So one of the things that we've actually tried to do here at Haverford coming out of the pandemic is make, especially our, our leadership team, um, give them the permission to go and establish those relationships uh, and have those experiences with peers at places like Gilman or St. Albans or others um, so that they can also have those connections. Um, because it's, it's uh, such a gift for me to be able to step away from the, the day-to-day here and, and connect with peers. And, and it can be harder for those people who are, who are in the thick of it every day, they're running a division or an office. And we've, uh, we've tried to, to allow them to have the time to go out and, and um, build that connective tissue with peers at other local and, and national schools. So Haverford School, uh, situated outside of Philadelphia, right down the street from my high school, Conestoga, there's so many good public and private schools in that area. And I think an interesting question maybe to hear you respond to is kind of how Haverford separates itself or finds its own lane. And I know, you know, Haverford to me, at least when I was growing up and now is one of the best all boys schools in the country. But how do you, I guess, find that lane amidst all other different and good schools in one yep. area and distinguish yourself and separate yourself. Yep. Uh, it's something that we, we talk about here all the time and that we can continue to um, do an, a good job of, of pushing forward. But it starts with our identity as a boys school and, and what that means. Um, I didn't go to a boys school growing up. Um, St. Albans was my first experience. But what I found at St. Albans and what I've seen here is that um, uh, boys schools provide their students with the opportunities to um, step into spaces that they might not in a co-ed environment that um, in those in those co-ed environments they might not feel as though they have permission as a boy to engage in those ways whereas here there aren't limitations to the the um, not just sort of programmatic opportunities they might have but also the the types of behaviors that are deemed cool or popular um, and I, I really hope at Haverford, it, it's, it's cool to be kind. It's cool to be sensitive. It's cool to be smart. Uh, it's cool to, to be engaged. Um, and, and so often to be a boy is to, to put on a mask and to, um, to not let people in, to not be outwardly vulnerable or, or authentic. Um, and in doing that, boys limit their growth. Um, and there's more and more research that's coming out about, um, how those limitations really set them behind in school and beyond and, and how um, girls and women are outpacing boys and men in so many different areas. And I do believe that it connects back to um, boys self-censoring, boys not approaching school um, uh, in, in the way that that they should. And, and I really hope at Haverford, um, it's a place where boys can give all of themselves to to school, to their their teachers, to their friends, um, to their advisors, and, and in doing so, allow those people to give all of themselves. Um, 
back in a, in a way that brings out the best in each other. Um, so often I think uh, that appears on the stage for us. Actually, we're just about to have our uh, our upper school play. The dress rehearsal was last night. We're doing Lane Miz. We have a really talented uh, senior class uh, performing artist this year. Um, and actually, there are, there are a couple guys who um, have to run back from the lacrosse game today down in Baltimore because <clears throat> they're they're in the show. Um, but it's sold out all all three nights, and um, it's uh, that that theater program is such a point of pride for us. But our our humanities classes, we have a, a program called Reflections where um, boys or faculty um, speak to the community about an experience that they've had, um, an aspect of who they are, the kind of wisdom and and character that's that's come from that. Um, and it, it really creates, I think, on campus, a culture of of openness mm -hmm. uh, and, and courage and support that, again, allows all of them to grow into their best selves. Yeah, I agree with that. I think one of the coolest things for me, and again, I didn't go to an all-boys school, but just from working at Gilman and teaching here, observing how certain students will, you know, play in the football game, but then at halftime sing in the choir or play the saxophone, right? We had one guy who was getting ready to go on the field against McDonough for the big rivalry game, but just before that he was playing the saxophone for the crowd. And yeah. I just think that's one of the coolest things is making the arts and things that otherwise wouldn't be deemed, you know, cool, maybe at other schools, that's awesome here. And I think Haverford, you know, as you said, does the same thing. Yeah, we hope so. We talk often about the three A's, uh, academics, arts, athletics, um, and being balanced with, with those. And to me, the sort of current that flows through all those is culture, um, the sort of un, unwritten rules um, and, and parameters that are established for the boys. And we've worked really hard coming out of COVID of reestablishing that culture, reminding the, the boys of what it, it means to be a member of this community, um, what our expectations are of them. And, and our hope is that the culture here is one of, of joyfulness um, and also standards, that often schools um, are either places of very high standards or of, of nurture and care and support. Um, and, and whereas the ones of high standards uh, sometimes can can be sort of joyless pressure cookers and the ones of of uh, nurture can be um, ones that don't necessarily ask a great deal of their students, I hope, at Haverford on the stage, in the studios, on the fields, the gym, in the classrooms. We are both a place that's asking a lot of, of the students um, and that's providing them with a positive environment, um, lots of encouragement, lots of joyfulness, um, that, it, that it's a place um, that is both challenging and where the kids love coming to school every day. So for you personally, it seems like, you know, you grew up on two boarding school campuses and then you went to Yale, played lacrosse and then to St. Albans and had so many different opportunities to grow as a leader. Um, so I'd love to just hear some experiences in your own life that really led you to your position now from a leadership standpoint. I teach a class in the fall called Leadership and Character and... I really like teaching that class because I get to explore, you know, different leaders who have so many various characteristics to, that makes them powerful or engaging or persuasive for people who look up to them or follow them. And I think it really comes down to points in our lives that ask us to step up or think about things in a different way and emerge as leaders. So maybe yeah. what are some, some of those moments for you that I guess, brought you to this point in your life now as the head of school at Haverford? Hmm. That's a great question. I I think part of it, I was really lucky at the the high school I went to um, to have a, a dynamic experience. Um, obviously, academically engaging, athletically engaging, but also um, engaging extracurricularly. I, I was able to do a lot of different stuff on on that campus and i loved sort of running from activity to activity and when i started teaching at st albans um, that was one of the most fun parts of the job especially coming from a job where i sat in a cubicle in front of a screen all day long to be able to run from class to advisory to chapel to lunch to to coaching i was just constantly on the move and i i just loved that that dynamism and and that energy 
And uh, I was fortunate uh, sort of coming out of grad school to be be given a position in the admissions office. And I, I really enjoyed working with prospective families and, and understanding the school in a little bit more of a, a sort of global macro way and, um, and packaging all of that in, in, in a presentation to families. Um, and when the director of admissions left, they asked me to step in that role and I, I loved it. And I knew that um, I didn't wanna do that forever. Um, that my days weren't quite as dynamic as they, they had been when I was teaching and coaching. Um, and then I moved into more of a sort of development strategic planning role as assistant head. And again, I, I loved that, but I knew that it was probably um, not my my forever job. And so one of the reasons why I was interested in being a head of school is because in this role, you get to do it all. I teach a class. Um, I get to spend time in three different divisions. Uh, I don't coach, but I I walk out to practices and throw a ball around with the guy, with the, the guys. Um, um, I obviously play a role in admissions and, and fundraising and strategic planning. And so it was a way for me to really uh, achieve my goal of doing a little bit of, of everything. And there, there are times when um, it seems overwhelming because there just aren't enough hours in the day to do all of those things. But I, I feel lucky every day to, to have a job that um, forces a level of, of engagement from me that, that I find so sustaining and nourishing. I think um Part of it is also my dad was ahead of school for 31 years and he's he's always been my hero. And uh, from an early age, I took an interest in his work. Um, I, I just remember being a kid and, and paying attention to the phone calls that he was on when we were driving places or, or asking him questions about different aspects of his job. Um, I loved sitting in his office um, and, and sort of observing him engage with different people. Um, so for whatever reason, um, probably just my my innate admiration and love for him. I was really drawn to to his work and the, and the impact that he had on people. I remember at a young age um, being keenly aware of the impact, the positive impact that he was having on people. And, and in some ways, that probably ties back to your definition of success. That that um, that was my definite definition of my father's success: his his positive impact on on others. Um, and then I, I, I guess the last thing um, that probably ties in, although it's something that I think about all the time, I don't know how much of a sort of motivator it was for me, but it's certainly a lesson that I apply to this role consciously and unconsciously all the time. Um, my college lacrosse team was not uh, a successful college lacrosse team. We were right on the cusp of of the Yale program getting very good. We were Coach Shea's uh, first recruiting class. And my senior year, we were four and 10. Sounds and like, sounds like my team. Of, my, of those 10 losses, uh, I think probably six or seven of them were one or two goal games. And it was just gut-wrenching to to have this moment where a senior year, I was, I was one of the leaders um, and to get so close, but never read enough uh, or, or close enough. Um, and sort of in hindsight, I made a number of, of leadership uh, mistakes that um, I didn't recognize at the time. Um, I didn't have the, the maturity and the, the wisdom and the experience, but um, I think it it motivated me to seek leadership opportunities where I could do a better job and I could step up and I could prove to myself that I was capable of doing some of the things that I wasn't able to do when, when uh, the moment presented itself earlier on in life. Yeah. It's interesting that you, first of all, talked about kind of your father's influence on you because again, I'm coming right from this class on death of a salesman and, and just the, the role of the father figure in a boy's life. You know, we both teach it or both are exist at all boys schools and think about this all the time, but having a male role model in your life is just so important. I think because, you know, you look at your father and you you take out the qualities about him that make him successful or a role model for you and try to emulate that in your own life. I think that's so important for a boy. Um, and I also think it's interesting that you hear you talk about your experience playing lacrosse. I had a very similar experience and really a set of failures through my lacrosse experience at Harvard. I know it sounds like playing lacrosse at Yale and Harvard are so glorious to a lot of people and it is, and it was an unbelievable opportunity, but there was a lot of adversity there that I think when you imagine what it's like to play lacrosse at the next level in college, 
um, you don't expect. You know, playing time, coaches, losing games, putting a lot of time and effort into something that doesn't actually pan out for you. I think it taught me so many different lessons about, I think, grit and determination and I guess swallowing your pride a little bit. All these things that play out uh, at the professional level too. Yep. Yeah, entirely. No, I'm as as painful as those experiences were for me. Uh, in my senior year, I wouldn't I wouldn't trade them for anything. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think being around a team too. You know, it's like uh, you have to swallow your ego a little bit sometimes and think about what's important for the school and for the team and for the future of your institution. Um, so I think you know my own experience playing lacrosse in college. I, I think about it all the time because it it shows up in my job as a teacher and a coach. Yep. Yeah. And that's been an interesting sort of piece of my learning in this job. The, the sort of lesson that one of the lessons that I took from my senior year was, was selflessness and, and servant leadership and just constantly focusing on other people and their development um, and not, not on my own, um, agenda or um, interests. And uh, I took that approach as a, as a teacher and, and as, an, as a coach, I never was a, a head coach of a program. I was the, the head JV lacrosse coach. Um, and I, I tried to take that approach <laughs> in running the development offices and admissions offices at St. Albans. Um, but here, what I found is there, uh, I've had to, to curb that approach a little bit to also make sure that I'm being very clear with people about what I need from them and that it's it's actually confusing to them sometimes to go into every meeting and um, just make myself available and, and uh, ask them what they, they need from me that they're looking, especially in, in years one and two, they're, they're trying to understand what's important to me, how I work, how they can support me. Um, and uh, I, I can't, uh, well, I, I hope I take a uh, sort of others first approach to it. I've learned that there also need to be times that I'm just clear with them about what my expectations are and, and why that um, is important uh, for our work together, both one on one and, and in the context of the leadership team, sort of establishing those clear lines of communication and expectations, I think has actually gone a long way in allowing us to to support one another in a, in a reciprocal way. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point and something that you really get to from teaching first before maybe entering leadership roles because I feel like all the time in my classes, I need to be so clear with juniors and seniors about what I want from them yeah. or else I'm going to get so many questions, you know, and uh, everyone's going to be confused. Um, so I think all of those steps along the, I guess, journey, uh, pay dividends. Yep. And I think the, you know, the, the hard part of stepping into a job, well, one of the hard parts of stepping into a job like this is I, I have less time individually with students. Um, and even though in my last few years at St. Albans, I wasn't teaching, um, uh, I was an advisor and I loved that work with, um, with my advisees and I'm, I'm co-teaching a class right now with, with our upper school head, a ninth grade ancient world history class. Um, but sort of recognizing that my interactions with students are going to be a little bit different. They'll probably be a little, a little shallower and yet what I'm able to accomplish in those quick moments with them, um, hopefully does have an impact on some level. They're, they're not in my office quite as frequently. We're not, um, sort of working through issues uh, together in, in an ongoing way. I've also had to learn to tell kids that they can't just pop by my office in the way that I used to at St. Albans all the time, say, just come by my office when you're free. Well, now usually I'm either in here meeting with somebody or I'm I'm not. It's my my assistant's job to sort of keep me, keep me busy. Um, so I've had to sort of uh, move away from that impulse to always just tell kids, come on by. Because um, then they come by and they're confused as to why I'm not <clears throat> available to them. So sort of just re recalibrating what my interactions with the students is like has, has been one of the many adjustments. Um, those interactions still are the highlights of my day. And I, I try to walk through campus as much as possible. Um, I try to know as, as many names as I possibly can. Um, 
to, to spend time with the kids sort of uh, in the spaces in between catching up with them, hearing how things are going. Um, and, and even though my days present uh, sort of less, less opportunity for that, still making sure that those interactions are ultimately what ground, what ground my experience. So I know you have to have to jump soon, but, uh, one of the things that we do on this podcast that I enjoy is I always ask my guests for a book recommendation, whether it's something that you're reading currently or thinking about currently or something that you've ever read in your life that really had an impact on you that maybe you still think about. That's a great question. I don't know that my my favorite book historically probably was or, or the book that had the the largest impact on me at the time was East of Eden by John Steinbeck, which I I probably read three times. Um and I, I love it in part because I love American history and there's something um about that book that that is sort of sentimental and romantic about American history. Um, but the the way that Steinbeck weaves the philosophy of of choices and and free will through through that uh, is something that I, I still come back to um, that I've used in some of my chapel talks at St. Albans or reflections here at Haverford. Um, and then the other one that's that it's a speech, but I go back and read it probably every three or four months is David Foster Wallace's This Is Water, Love which it. is his commencement speech at Kenyon, um, which also is, is often is really about consciousness and choices. And um, so those are the ones that I uh, I sort of turn to time and time again. And that sort of certainly for me um, reflect my educational philosophy of, of teaching kids to, to make choices. Great choices. I love that speech by, by David Foster Wallace. Um, well, thank you so much. I, I know you have to run today, but no, thank I, you. And again, I'm so sorry. And we can always schedule another half hour. Um, and, and sort of separately, I would love to connect with you and just hear about your career and different things that are on your mind. Um, I, I just want to make sure that I'm a resource for you. I know you've got Henry and plenty of other people in your world, but um, if, if I can support your growth in any way, please let me know. Thanks so much. I'd love to get together in person when you're, when yeah. you're down in Baltimore, but I appreciate are your parents you. still here. They are. Yeah. So I'll, I'll be, I'll be in the Philly area. So I'll let you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, please do let me know. It'd be fun to get, get a cheesesteak somewhere and catch up and, um, whatever I can do to help. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Talk to you soon. 